of the bitter ministrations of the grand professors who act the part most gleefully of stern aggressors. Enough to put you in a, in a fright. But you only have one paper to write. But have you ever wondered what it's like to read 800? <laughs> Never mind. Be sure if you're not punctual, without compunction, I will flunk you all. <laughs> <laughs> So, ladies and gentlemen, there is a jolly little message, and I know none of you believe that I'm capable of such firmness of purpose, hmm, that I will actually be demonic and throw you in the waste paper basket if you don't get those papers in. But I just have to tell you that I'm due to leave for England on the 18th of June. Uh, and uh, if you don't get into habits of punctuality now, you never will. And if I let you get away with handing in late papers after Wednesday, you'll think that you can hand in late papers at the end of the quarter. So I simply am going to be utterly, 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 damnably, difficultly, beastly, woebegonely, miserably, but nonetheless, Sternly, monolithically, terrifically, mm, ruthless. There are a small number, or there is a small number of people of the utmost cunning, or the greatest poetic talent, who have come up to me and said, Oh dear, Professor Rose, mm, I have a fancy to do, to do the poetry and illustration thing i.e. I'm a bloody procrastinator. <laughs> mm? If I do that little double show, when do I have to get it in? And of course I should have said, on Wednesday. But I foolishly said to the first one, who is particularly charming and beseeching, I said, all right, if you're going to do the double go, you can hand it in on the day that the art projects are due. So those of you who wish to do the book illustration, do the Billy Blakery. But, if you wish to do that, my dears, there is one thing that I insist upon, and that is that you hand in a note on Wednesday saying that you are a procrastinator, uh, that you're an idle dog, that you think you can put everything off to the Greek calends. I have already received one such nice missive. It was written in lovely rhyme, and started off, Jasper, Jasper, burning bright, how you give me such a fright. Uh, <laughs> but I'm a disciple of William Blake, so will you take my paper and his lovely illustrations mm, at the time of the confounding of the nations, uh, or some such. So, and that young man, I think it is, but it might be a young woman, because young women are just as witty as young men, that young man will get a notation on his evaluation, if they ever get written, which says, brilliant, mm? deserves to be as idle as he is. Mm? <laughs> Can justify tergiversation with neatness of rhyme. So please, darlings, I'm not asking you for a terrible lot, I'm only asking you for what is my really my little pound of flesh, dears. Mm, and I promise that I won't take any blood with the flesh. Mm? Please can I have them on Wednesday and please will you tell your absent colleagues mm, about it because otherwise some of them are going to be very well begone. And please with dear creatures who are sitting on the floor fill up some of the uh, seats. There are plenty of seats. Now would people put up hands where they're near, where they're near empty seats? Because you might just as well be comfortable the whole business of keeping... Come on, there's one nice one there, darling. Look, come on, come on. You can't see anything down there. Come on, get on with it. Either you leave the room or get into a proper chair. Come on. Come on, dears. There are plenty... Look, there's some more nice ones here. For crying out loud, why make yourself miserable and blind yourself? Well, no, that one's a little bit dubious. All right, so... I really don't think 
I've got very much more to say at this stage. Oh, yes, I've got something more to say, but not of an administrative kind. And, uh, Rosalie, they were listening to the first movement of Beethoven's Seventh Symphony, yes. I, I'd hoped that we were going to get on to the slow movement so as to give you some sense of his variety of mood, which is really quite extraordinary. However, uh, I don't propose to linger over the musical issues. I want the lights off and uh, the screen down, uh, and I want then to talk a little bit about the whole situation during the revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars. And this is actually how the revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars were greeted by many people in England. Hmm? They had, we must suppose, better things to do. Uh, it's a very funny little, and I enjoy it so much, these are such eager little slippers, aren't they? Hmm? Uh, and, I mean, have you, ever seen, have you ever seen Four Shoes tell such a dramatic story with such acclaim, venom, uh, and uh, succulence? Uh, I think one of the things that we have to realize is that while, of course, the revolution in the Paleolithic Wars really involved the whole of Europe, in England, it did involve, the, the English were involved with a difference. And the difference simply was that 20 miles of water which Napoleon quite, never quite managed to cross. And the successful quality of repression in England. The uh, English government immediately clapped on a whole fresh set of gag laws, sedition laws, and so on and so forth. In Scotland, there were enormously powerful prosecutions of even the mildest little old liberals. And in fact, George, Charles James Fox, who led the pro-revolutionary and eventually sort of semi-pro-Napoleonic... Why does the name of Charles James Fox send people spinning out of the room, I wonder? Uh, he was a great gambler, and he was a roué, but I, really quite incomprehensible. Anyhow, uh, the government thought of prosecuting Charles James Fox. Uh, it didn't, but in 1794 it was a very, very near thing. I want you to think in the deepest terms, not only about what happened during the Revolutionary Napoleonic Wars, and, you know, the fact that the whole of Germany was remodeled in 1805. The Holy Roman Empire came to an end, and Napoleon reduced the 250, 260 teeny little states and rather larger states of Germany to a mere 58. He got, well, you've seen his sister portrayed by Canova, brothers sat on various thrones, his, one of his marshals, Joachim Murat, sat upon the throne of Naples. N Napoleon reorganized Italy. But of course, that was, a, that was a bright and tinsel side of the revolution in the Napoleonic Wars. Another side was somewhat grimmer. And uh, I want you to think about what it was like, let's have a next, to live in the Napoleonic Wars and in the aftermath. Why the English could have wonderful jokes about William Pitt over here with his long pokey little nose, and his absence of chin, which doesn't make up for his greediness. And you see here is uh, William Pitt taking the ocean, mm, and Napoleon taking Europe, and this is the little, the little uh, uh, coxcomb Napoleon, while the English could on occasions be at least frivolous and uh, hearty and amused by the Napoleonic Wars. And if you read the novels of Jane Austen, you would not know that Europe was conflagrating you simply wouldn't know, because people still took tea in England and played bridge and flirted rather sillily, and one or two young girls in the Bennett family went rather mad after the military. Uh, but in much of Europe, you rarely knew it. In Naples, there was revolution and counter-revolution and revolution and counter-revolution, as Lady, Lady Hamilton, the Divine Emma, and uh, Lord Nelson managed to bolster up the rather dreadful Bourbon regime. Uh, the, in 1797, the uh, great uh, Republic of Venice collapsed, and then Venice became under uh, sort of North Italian rule, and then under Austrian rule. Eventually, remember that Napoleon, let's have a look at the next, Napoleon sacked his first wife, Josephine, because she wouldn't bear him any children, and thought up a very much better wheeze. He married the daughter of a Habsburg. I won't show you her typical Habsburg face with that rather large chin and that rather disagreeable lip, but she, at any rate, was good breeding stock. 
and the young king of Rome was going to be the dynastic heir of Napoleon himself. But of course, his ambition knew no bounds. This handsome, agreeable young man uh, in the lovely velvet suit, painted by the young Angra, with the same chair that, Napoleon, that, that David painted him, soon becomes the kind of Moloch, hmm? the kind of Moloch emperor. Do you suppose that various presidents would have liked to wear something like that? Mm -hmm. instead of those interminable Brooks Brothers suits. Mm -hmm. uh, wearing wonderful symbols of imperial rule and almost trampling upon the Habsburg or Hohenzollern eagle. In fact, he's trampling on one of them just as he married into the Habsburg family. And of course, it meant a terrible time for many an ordinary person as Napoleon's armies fought through Spain, ravaged their way through northern southern Italy, fought in the Swiss Alps, fought uh, across the plains of Carinthia, fought into Hungary, fought across all northern Germany, uh, at battle after battle after battle, uh, and then finally did that absurd, appalling, snowbound traips to Moscow and back. And uh, what was it like? What was it like for ordinary people? Uh, and what was it going to be like in the Reconstruction? It was all very well for Canova to do a Napoleon looking like Apollo. And this is actually Apollo's body and Napoleon's head. And the copy of it was bought by the Duke of Wellington and lowered very slowly into the foyer at Apsley House. The Duke of Wellington had a fine sense of humour and loved to point out to his dinner guests after the Napoleonic Wars his greatest trophy, Napoleon in the fig leaf. Uh, but what was it really like and how was the aftermath going to be? Well, here is Turner doing the aftermath, Napoleon in exile at St. Helena, and compared to a barnacle. You can't easily, unless you pick it out very closely, see the barnacle, but the barnacle is down here, or the limpet. It's called the exile and the limpet. And what Turner, of course, is saying in this wonderful sunset scene with an el elongated Napoleon reflected upon this miserable, washed up, ragged, wretched, strewn shore with, of course, a good Englishman on guard behind him to see that he's not going, once more going to escape. Turner really says that the sunset of empire is curdled and yellow uh, and pink and dreadful, but a little creature like a sea limpet can stick it out and stick it out. And empires come and go, but nature goes on forever. And in one sense, one of the great pictorial responses to um, the Napoleonic epoch is the development of landscape painting. But Napoleon is surrounded by ocean and the free airs and great breezes, which of course means that he's not so dangerous to the English. And in any case, the English have got other preoccupations. Another Turner which we return to called the Fighting Temeraire. And again, it shows you the old battle walls, the old wooden walls of old England, hearts of oak are our ships, jolly tars are our men. And we've always got Nelson to beat the French. In any case, we have a rather new and nasty little object here, which if I'd been born in those days, I no doubt would have played many, many satirical verbal tricks on, a nasty little, a nasty little tugboat, mm, a little paddle steamer, hauling away the ancient world, so that England can be involved with the Industrial Revolution. But what was it like to be in civil war-strewn Spain, or decimated France, or roused and reawakened Germany? What did the Napoleonic uh, meteor mean uh, in Europe, as distinct from England. Well, in England, oh, how cosy. This is, in fact, a great battle scene. Wouldn't you know it? The Duke of Wellington commissioned young Mr. David Wilkie, a Scottish painter, a very great canniness and a very considerable care in the raking in of his spondulix, his oof, his boodle, Hmm? commissioned young Mr. David Wilkie to paint something which would commemorate the Battle of Waterloo. Does Mr. David Wilkie paint the Duke of Wellington himself on his famous charger Copenhagen uh, with bullets whistling through his uh, hat? 
uh, of the Battle of Waterloo. No, David Wilkie deals with the Battle of Waterloo by having nice Chelsea pensioners, that's to say, you know, old vets let out to grass, sitting at home, drinking their beer, and reading the dispatches of the Battle of Waterloo. How clever, how nice, how cosy, how essentially civilian mm, that English point of view was. There's a nice story about Mr. Wilkie and the Duke of Wellington. Wilkie presented this lovely painting full of, you know, such funny faces uh, and eager young women wondering about the casualty list and elderly pensioners, wounded, mutilated creatures saying, ha, 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 well, I knew that young Jem Scroggs would get it. Mm? Had both his legs blown off? Ha, ha, ha. Mm? Yes. Mm? And Picton dead? He was a fine soldier. What hell? Mm? Well, young Mr. Davy, Day, Wilkie brought his painting to Apsley House and said to the Duke, here's your painting, my, my Lord, your Grace, sir. Mm? And the Duke said, uh, how much is it? How much is it, Mr. Wilkie? Oh, oh, well, Your Grace, it's, it's, it's only, it's only 1,500 guineas. Only 1,500 guineas. Uh, all right, Mr. Wilkie, where's my checkbook? Oh, Your Grace, Your Grace, you don't have to write it. You don't, I, I, no, 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 I'm not going to have a checkbook. No, 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 where's my, where are my guineas? Oh, oh, Your Grace, Your Grace, there's no hurry. No, 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 any time, any time a check would do, any time, please. No, no, don't, I don't need cash, no, I trust you entirely, Your Grace. Good God, ma'am. Do you want my banker to see how I waste my money? You have very, very weak sense of humours. Hmm? <laughs> what? <laughs> what? I tell you a very funny story, not terribly well, and you laugh. Ex <laughs> you laugh extremely badly. Hmm? <laughs> well, well, a shocking shambles of a lot altogether. Anyhow, the aftermath. And of course, in England, the revolutionary panic was a matter of finance. The great thing is the, is the Industrial Revolution. And in fact, the English, unlike almost all European countries, managed to come to a 19th century constitution without violent revolution. And so a painter has to paint civilian meetings with orators and crowds, rather than barricades uh, and musketeers. But what about the rest of Europe? Now, I submit to you, you can recognize this man extremely well. All you have to do is to go down to the vet's building on a bad day. And I submit to you furthermore that you are in some ways in the position of the young men and young women after the war who don't fully understand what it was to be in the war, who don't really sympathize with the terrors of being a young conscript. And let me remind you that by 1813, the French were inducting 13-year-olds and 14-year-olds into their shrunken armies after the retreat from Moscow. And this is a great painting of a lunatic painted in 1822-1823 who is a victim of the Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars painted by Theodore Jericho. And he wears a military cap. And he has a military medal. And he's mixed up between delusions of military grandeur and, of course, the deepest fear of a world of the most terrifying slaughter and the most frightening woundings. If you want to know a little bit about what it was like to get wounded in the 19th century, Read White Jacket by Herman Melville. There's a most extraordinary account of uh, somebody having their leg amputated in that book. And if you ever fancy living before the middle of the 19th century, don't. Because it's in the middle of the 19th century you start getting anywhere near effective anaesthetic. But here you see, and that is what you might, if you're really a bright and extraordinary and gifted painter, you might think about painting in the aftermath. And what would you feel? There's this whole problem of feeling in the aftermath of a great war. Some people turn from the war with tremendous relief. 
the people who've been through it. Some people have no more than a shattered soul, which is very difficult to turn into art. For the youngsters who never really were in the war, who came in on the very last phase of it, it's a different matter. How do you live in the aftermath? What feats of heroism can you do after a great war? Hmm? And so you may go in for various kind of exotic causes. And that is what many of the artists, younger artists of Europe did. Europe was played out, just as you might suppose in some ways the United States is played out. So European artists went further afield and sought for romantic causes in Greece, in North Africa, in India, just as you might seek for exotic good causes outside the United States. What did you do? What did you do when you faced up against it? Well, you began to look melancholy. You began to suffer from what a contemporary writer called mal de René. Hmm? What in German is called Weltschmerz. World sorrow. Hmm? Because the great days have gone by and you are pygmies. Hmm? Contemplating Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty in despair, nothing beside remains. Hmm? The aftermath of the Napoleonic myth, the aftermath of grandeur in Europe, a time for desperate soul self-searching, and a time when the lessons of war and the lessons of revolution should be being digested. But those are the most difficult lessons that you can possibly digest. And it requires... Hmm? More than this sweet, silky young man who is so abashed by it. Let's have a look at the next. More than the flight, in this case, of a man called George Chinnery to Hong Kong, where he paints out the last part of his life. Uh, and you can see him doing little Chinese scenery. More indeed hmm, than the Turkish delights to digest that war. And it was really left, very largely speaking, of course, to Goya to do it. And we're now going to turn to Goya, and we see Goya recognizing the perilous state of Europe in this great series of about 80, I think, uh, engravings. They are etched aquatints, which form the series of the Caprichos. And the Capricho, C-A-P-R-I-C-H-O-S, which you should all be able to spell and which you should all be able to recognize, the Caprichos start off by being merely satirical. And they satirize a common kind of thing. They even satirize the same kind of thing that you saw in that English print uh, of those large feet and those small feet by Gilray. But the sleep of reason does produce monsters. And so Goya graduates. There we are, there's a preliminary. Here's the final title page with the affrighted cat the terrible owls and the smirking owls and the cackling owls and human beings bending their heads down in absolute fear at the world that they themselves have released from my old social satire. Let's have a look at the next. From my, I mean, you know, what is this? I mean, it's a very simple, straightforward thing. You can see this on the Santa Cruz campus any day. Mm -hmm. What is it? A kind of rather superannuated TA, perhaps, a rather superannuated undergraduate, hmm? or maybe it's just a rather super, under, under, uh, super, uh, superannuated undergraduate. But uh, uh, ugliness and beauty, hmm? ugliness pursuing beauty is so common a theme, everybody does it. Though it must be said, this is a particularly terrifying, smirky little ugliness, isn't it? And look at those beastly little twiddly twaddly legs. And she wrings her hand, and some people think, oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. But look, he himself, uh, presumably an elderly aristocrat, has a mouth which would swallow her down in one quick gulp. Hmm? Jokes, obvious, simple, only saved by the sheer, sheer salacity of the, of the, no, no, the lubricity of the participants and Goya's ruthless. Uh, exposition. Let's have a look at the next. Or again, old vanity. Yes, and the young people say, oh my God, you know, it's auntie again. Mm -hmm. She's had her face lifted for the 17th time. Oh, well, you know, but I do would really rather like her house in Orange County uh, or wherever. 
Hmm? I mean a satire which is permanent uh, and goes for all time. Ah, but again done with such venom. Look at the little bony knee. Look at the wonderful skinny little arms. And look at the huge, huge, huge set of ribbons and that scrudgy little flushy face. Mm, like a, wiz a wizened monkey on a spree. Let's have a look at the next. And then, oh, the amorosity of this. It's, it's, it comes directly from Hogarth, a nice, little, a nice little shaving, and she's pursing her lips, and she's wondering exactly where his uh, unseen hand is about to debouche. Mm? Uh, a nice scene of domestic intimacies. Mm? with a slightly transvestite. But suddenly, it grows dark. And bogles are abroad. Mm. And a mere little piece of cloth suddenly flashes out. And the wind takes it. And you've got a ghost. You've got a piece of subtle, wild incrimination. You've got a whole world of huddled creatures against the grim storm of nature. And they are now about what sort of things? Well, maybe a bit of grave, grave pollution, a little bit of body snatching, a little bit of noctambulation of a sinister kind. And how about this one? Well, of course, all those satires, all those funny mesalliances lead to the duel. But the duel is serious. Mm? And the woman weeps absolutely abandonedly, and the man expires in a clumsy mannequin pose. And the blood pours all over the place. Let's have a look at the next. But still, within the normal range of satire, but it's getting more and more complicated. Who is this creature? Who is this creature? What on earth has happened to this poor woman? Where is she going to be dragged? Into what common pit is she going to be flung? What common yet terrible disaster has she experienced? All done, 1799, to 1801, and there's for more to come. Because now we enter the animal world, and of course, again, it's a very old tradition to satirize human beings by their animal counterparts. And here, as you can see, there's a rather goofy ass who is enjoying a perfectly dreadful squawky serenade uh, from this cheerful little opera singer. And the ass's front hooves are going, oh, goodness, oh, it's all for me. Ah. Mm. Ah, good fun, but not of any great depth. Or oh, let's have a look at another. There are a whole group of these in the Capriccios. What is happening here? Well, this is my lord ass, my lord donkey, looking at his genealogical tree and seeing what other wonderful asses in such absolute plentifulness he has descended from. Mm -hmm. By the way, in this one, you can see the working of the aquatint particularly clearly. And, well... Oh, one dear to the heart of a portrait painter. Hmm? Asinine portraiture. Uh, and, uh, I mean, this goes back, actually, well to the world of Votto. But there's more to come. Because the surrealist humour of Goya begins to intervene. And where shall they sit down? What shall they sit down on? Hmm? The world is really turning topsy-turvy. And look at these funny, sort of vegetable-like little prongy legs. And why are they wearing so very little? It must be some kind of jolly brothel, mustn't it? Uh, and they're playing some game of musical sexy chairs or something. <laughs> uh, we must suppose. But a world in which uh, they're not fit to sit down and they're not fit to stand and everything has become... Scrooges and alarming, uh, and the ladies are victims, but willing victims. And then something much more frightening the dead who refuse to die, the people who come out of the tombstone. Uh, and the satire becomes much, much deeper and much, much less predictable as witches begin to spout uh, on uh, Goya's etching needles, and the little children themselves begin to spout immense masses of, of wind as they use like little bellows in order uh, to get a jolly fire going. And uh, more and more witches and hobgoblins lurch up through the deadening and stifling, suffocating, stygian night. Ah, uh, bony people with glee and joy 
Hmm? Sacrificing to what minor diabolical world? And you look at the scrawny legs, you look at the battered arms, and yet the same violent and fantastic vitality. And of course one of the things that Goya really says is that human beings are so awful because they can get so much enjoyment out of such obscenity. Obscene, crazed, ancient themselves, fit for the decorous business of being senior citizens. And yet what citizenry these seniors perpetrate with the young. And let's look on. Are then human beings are no longer the point. Strange, massive, grand monsters, part human, part uh, entirely animal, but other parts nearly some kind of awful crossing of the lines between uh, one species and another. Hmm? Creatures that could be so human, not amiable Chinese dragons, but dreadful mesalliances of the imagination frightful blendings of alternatives and then so full of such absolutely human vanity such tremendous human glee at the delight of their having their own little claws clipped and then again you've seen a barber look exactly like this You've had your hair chopped by one such, I'm sure, at some time or another sedulous, totally absorbed in his silly trade Human, but not human. But are humans human? That seems to be the question that uh, Goya wanted to ask eventually. And of course he wasn't allowed to ask it. Because the caprichos were suppressed. There's a wonderful detail. The caprichos were suppressed and only a few editions were pulled. A few, a few, a few numbers were pulled, I don't know, somewhere about 30. Because they were done at the royal, in the royal printing works. They were advertised, but uh, it was quite clear that much of the satire was aimed at nobles, was aimed at the government, and so it was not to be tolerated. And this wonderful, gleeful creature was banished till long after Goya's death. Very few people knew uh, of the Capriccios. But I believe that Delacroix had a copy because, you see, the French armies, the French armies, I wish people would not all the time leave in the middle of a lecture. If you don't want to be at the lecture, don't come. But it's extraordinarily distracting. You've no need to come. It's just gross bad manners to leave in the middle. Unless you're feeling that your heart is going to give out on you. Hmm? Ah, there he is. Gleeful, insinuating, menacing. Hmm? A wonderful figure from the Capriccios. But there's yet other to come. Let's have a look at the next, please. For a very short while, around about 1800, the illuminated, mm, uh, the liberals, held their government. Uh, and this is uh, uh, Jovellanos, who was the chief liberal minister. And as you can see, he is not finding it very, very easy. He looks a little bit like, oh, what's the name of that nice senator who tried to be president? McGovern. <laughs> and he has about the same sort of... You know, that, that the honesty and sweetness of McGovern and the same chance of keeping going, I would say. Mm? Uh, and it's really obviously a headache to him. Uh, and Goya's sympathy is so much with him and there's so much with this French envoy. A revolutionary envoy wearing, as you can see, the red and white and blue cockade uh, on his hat, Guy Merde, And Goya went around with the Franco-Spanish liberal crowd. Mm -mm. so that he's going to be particularly torn up when it all turns to the bad. Let's have a look at the next. Because, of course, Maria Louise out on her horse, she triumphs, and between 1800 and 1808, everything goes to the bad as she more and more entangled with the, the Prince of Peace. And so Goya's sense of disaster and uh, madness deepens, and the Capriccios are succeeded by the Disparates, which are really more strange capriccios. And now their, their sense of satirizing ordinary sociality gives way to the madness of people flying like bats hither and thither in the smoky gloom 
of the sky, or uh, and, 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 and remember how Goya had made uh, a vision of this in the 1780s. What is it now, this horrid little piece of chopped up meat which they're throwing about up there, which really encapsulates the whole of the painting of that 20th century English master, Francis Bacon. Well, what had it been before? Something much more mild and modest, you remember. But his vision and his technique deepen, and finally he does that image, which is the image taken up by Cathy Kolwitz, taken up by Honoré Daumier, familiar to us from a Buchenwald at Dachau, and from a, a hundred camps, some of which, of course, was spread in the United States itself. The displaced people. The people with no nationality, no home, no place on this earth, huddling on the last little branch of the last little tree set out in space. And of course it does prefigure what we might well experience if one of our little capsules should get into the, uh, get into the upper air and start trivially swizzling round Venus or Mars and then the great conflagration down below. Imagine what it would be like if you were an aeronaut and the balloon went up. Hmm? And there were a terrible nuclear disaster on this planet. These are... These are preliminaries for such a terrible vision. Uh, and, in fact, if you look at the old newsreels of the 1940s, you see people like that week after week after week. And if you care to, you can see people not unlike that week after week after week, destitute, transient, thrown out, human garbage in the parks and fair places of Santa Cruz. So that his vision is an astonishing vision, with or without what happens in Spain, which of course is the bloodiest civil war you can imagine, and which he immortalizes, not so much in the Disparates, but in the Horrors of War series. But where is his drawing of the Duke of Wellington? Now, the Duke of Wellington was an astonishingly tough, hmm, commanding and strange man. You know what the Duke of Wellington said? There's only one thing sadder in the world than a great victory, and that's a great defeat. There's only one thing sadder than a great victory, and that's a great defeat. The Duke of Wellington had no love for war, and you can see it here. He's just been victorious of the splendid victory won by Spanish and English troops at Salamanca, I think. And Goya catches him, but Goya doesn't catch him with a smirk of triumph on his silly face. Doesn't catch him like a gross pork butcher reorganizing the civil laws of France. Doesn't catch him like a godlike <coughs> Apollo or grand, handsome young victor, Master Napoleon, that terrible, terrible scourge. Goya captures him with a glazed look of horror on his face. He's seen men and the ghosts of men. He's seen all there is to see in the bloody war. And he's cowed by it. He's cowed by it. And Goya is cowed by it, but determined to do it justice. It's fascinating to compare a number of military pictures. And here, of course, is one painted by Trumbull, the great American painter who dedicated himself. We've already seen him painting the Declaration of Independence. And here, I think, is Bunker's Hill. And, of course, it's a jolly little affray. Uh, and people are full of heroism, and even the dying have time to droop their arms elegantly. <laughs> and the living have ta ha time to hold their fusils correctly. Mm? And there are even people whose hair is neatly pomaded, mm? and thwick, thwack, thwick, thwack, but the banners fly, uh, and it's all worth it, perhaps. 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 <coughs> all we can see... The other American, John Singleton Copley, doing the English raid, or the, the English skirmish in uh, uh, St. Ge uh, Jersey, not Guernsey, but Jersey, a famous episode of the uh, American Revolutionary War. And as you can see, both black and white, intensely heroic, more poor Major Pearson has had it, but the flag nonetheless still flies splendidly. Mm. And uh, you look aside for a moment for some poor dead uh, 
a comrade, but you still surge forward uh, and the civilians get out of the way looking really quite neat and in not too bad a shape. But then that's just a little safe skirmish. Or you can have a look at the next, mm, the Battle of Nazareth by Baron Gross. And here the sand is getting into people's nostrils a bit. And here the horses have really had it. And here the corpses begin to pile up. And it's very hot and very dusty and pretty displeasing. But of course it's such a huge melee that you don't really get a chance easily to survey the individual horror of war. Each finger, each thumb, each toe, each kneecap, each teeny fleshly sacrifice. But for Goya, it's a different matter. No grand scrimmages. And of course for Goya, Baron Gross's notion of Napoleon as somehow riding the storm, as somehow being superior as a gesture of a mere man justifying and consoling and saying, yes, this is terrible, but we have won a great victory to these poor frozen corpses, over life size, by the way. Goya can't see it in those terms. In 1808, the Spanish monarchy's success is suppressed, and Joseph Bonaparte enters Madrid to rule it on behalf of his brother. Napoleon. And the Spanish, perhaps with typical bloodthirstiness, perhaps with typical folly, perhaps with typical courage, perhaps with a mixture typical of all three, and with a blind patriotism, rise and on the 2nd of May and attack Murat's cavalry, and then on the 3rd of May are suppressed and massacred. And so we see the famous 3rd of May. And Goya manages to clarify warfare, us, warfare for us in no small way. Contrasting the mechanicality of the soldiers in their brutal uniforms, like so many metal zombies, repetitive, disciplined, unthinking, just so many repeated curves, so many repeated sabers, so many bang, bang, bangs, mm -hmm totally subsumed in their uniform, no longer human at all, as against, of course, the extraordinary flurry and pathos of the human flesh, half, de half, half bare, hmm? with, a really, with a really, for once, a substantial amount of blood, and, of course, with a patriot hmm, facing the squad in a gesture of Christ crucified, and the whole thing happened in that ugly hugger-mugger by the dim night, uh, and Madrid in the background, churches not lit by moonlight, but lit by some kind of horrible flash of determination that this thing shall be seen, and unavailing, useless, useless, when the human beings wish to be totally barbarous, and more come up and plunge forward, clumsily, despairingly, and totally unwillingly, by the light of this horrid, flaring lantern. The 2nd of May, yes, the 2nd of May, is full of uh, high jinks. Hmm? But actually, already you see the bodies strewing the floor. And uh, you imagine what it's like to be a mameluk suddenly stabbed on the back of your horse. And of course, what are the horses to do with this filthy human quarrel? Well, Goya saw such sights between 1808 and 1814 as human beings should never really have to see. And the 2nd and 3rd May were painted not on the spot, dears. The camera will do that for us. Of course, it wouldn't in that period. But the camera will only give you one teeny little piece. This is digested horror. This is as far as the, the range of art can really go. And I'd like you to think for a moment about this because 
Goya reaches to the same world that Tolstoy reaches towards, that Picasso, I think, absolutely unavailingly reaches towards, that Dostoevsky reaches towards. And perhaps Goya gets somewhere between Tolstoy's War and Peace or indeed uh, uh, Thomas Hardy's uh, The Dinas and uh, the more immediate shock of Dostoevsky. And in fact, of course, the revolution in the Napoleonic Wars, because they were national wars, because they involved casualties on a new scale, and they involved uniforms on a new scale, and munitions on a new scale, and involved ambitions on a new scale, really begin to cast a kind of lurid light over our sense of what human beings are. And when you have seen Goya's 2nd and 3rd of May, or when you've examined closely his uh, etchings of the disasters of war, let's go on. Mm. You need no grammar of Buchenwald. You need no soapbox holocaust. And you have things in a deeper, if darker, perspective. And such deeds are still with us. The extraordinary thing is that some artists have the ability. Well, first of all, of course, the most strange thing is that Goya, in some sense, can stand aside. But he doesn't take sides. That he is never a propagandist hmm, on a small scale. He's not even a propagandist on a large scale. He can't even say, well, human beings are just absolutely awful. Hmm? He just says, this is what I saw. This is how it is. This is what human beings can do. This is what human beings in certain circumstances probably must do, can't avoid doing. Hmm? And what is it? Is this man incapable of going home and lighting his pipe and eating his lasagna? Or his cocoa What is it that can denature us? What is it can denature us in this kind of way? Hmm? Rape and murder. And here's a close up. And you see, he has no hesitation in offering you every violent tremor in his technique. Indeed, he finds the perfect technique for expressing. These terrifying, they're almost insect-like movements, aren't they? They have a kind of precise madness, which is so full of despair. Do you look how his netching needle trembles here, and then draws more swiftly, and then comes in a cataract of violence? Mm? And you look at how he spends his own despair and rage in the raging of his technique. And yet, you see, he does not fall over into the blither of abstraction in the way that something of the despair of Jackson Pollock falls over into the blither of abstraction in the late 1940s. And the sheer violence of marking is the violence which you see in many an abstract expressionist between 1940 and 1960. But it's all controlled to a fearful meaning. Paul Clay, as a young man, does some pretty nasty human creatures. Mm, sometimes they are a little bit bird-winged. They're never cut off in this kind of way, and they're never strewn about a useless landscape. And of course, I suppose here, Goya offers you that extra thought. If human beings could really control trees, what would they grow on them? What would they grow on them? It's fortunate that we still are so little along our way with any technical advances. Otherwise, surely, we would grow human mutton chops instead of apples. And the sense of cannibalism 
is very, very deep in this period. The sense of human beings utterly out of control. There is one heroic image, so far as I can recall, in the disasters wars, and this is the fair maid of Saragossa, who at a crucial moment in the siege of Saragossa took hold of a great cannon and amongst the dead pointed it at the enemy. But her face is away from us. She doesn't emerge for any length of time, and the deeds of disgust so outnumber the deeds of succor, the deeds of Ruth, the deeds of uh, daring. No wonder that Goya, who saw all this, does this tremendous painting of panic, hmm? of the masses of human beings who throw themselves into some meaningless and ceaseless tearing across. Please don't move too fast, dear boy. Uh, could we go back? Hmm? Almost as though, I mean, he's rehearsing a Cecil B. De Mille spectacular of a disaster in the Midwest. Hmm? And then this groping, huge, myopic creature, hmm? which is, perhaps, represents the general will, represents the blind forces of the crowd, unleashed, which represents you and me, if we do not grapple with our problems, with all our spiritual and intellectual force. If anybody, Goya, tells you how desperate our situation is and how tremendously we need to struggle, if we are to in any way understand or master it. And cosily riding downtown on a little MG hmm, to slip into uh, oh, Taco Bell or Hillary's or hmm, to slurp away a couple of hours at the catalyst. So easy. But darlings, don't be comfortable. It's not a cozy world. It's not a cozy world. We have to protect ourselves. And Goya manages to live without the sort of protection of illusion that most of us. Hmm? Goya lives without the protection of illusion. And we cannot, we, cannot, we cannot entirely cast our illusions aside. Otherwise, most of us would run entirely mad. Hmm? Nor do we have to be prurient. And that is another thing which I think the late 20th century has come round to is a kind of prurience about horror, a fascination with horror. Uh, uh, horror from the depth uh, of the waterbed. Horror from the comfy Sears Roebuck armchair. Hmm? We all know it. We all succumb to it. But you and I should do better, because we've seen Gaia. Uh, and what was then to happen? What was then to happen after the Napoleonic Wars? Hmm? Most people were going to return away with a great sense of relief. But how could, how could a serious young painter, a young Monsieur Jericho, takes up the theme of cannibalism, of horror, in 1818-1819 with his wrath of the Medusa to which we will shortly return. And in 1818-1819, almost exactly the same time, Goya still mulls over what he has seen in the extraordinary paintings in the house of the deaf man, the great frescoes, and he does an enormous witch's sabbath. But is it really a witch's sabbath or is it just another group of displaced and violently distorted and hopeless and eyeball-rolling creatures who are part of uh, the underbelly of our world. And when you look at the freedom of the technique here and the incessant and deliberate and tremendous distortion you see into a world which Daumier will take up, which Lautrec will in some ways trivialize, and which very few 20th century artists have successfully grappled with. Perhaps the 20th century has made horror corny. And then images of uh, levitators and huge rocks again and, uh, uh, and people with their telescopes. A world in which 
actually Jules Verne is foreseen and a horror with our own world and the need to leave it is possibly well expressed and here are more figures strange fates playing with human beings ugly distorting snippers of the ordinary human life the fates themselves Coquito and Co hmm? ruling over the landscape brooding over the landscape oblivious uncaring and terrifying and perhaps the most haunting of all Goya's image the dog we don't know whether the dog is just drowning in a quicksand or the dog is just looking over a bank or the dog is existing in some kind of driving mist some end of the world some last little shred of animal existence as the whole solid frame of our planet is shrouded and as in Shakespeare just dissolves in a mist and perhaps that is what Goya might have wanted except that Goya has this extraordinary power of ceaseless rejuvenation and he makes his Leocardia his young muse look at it in amazement and then about the same time he does a whole series of work people strenuous and cocky and uh, capable and then a series of startling still lives in which on the one hand his sense of the supremacy of the artist hmm, able to make wonderful wonderful paint out of some slices of salmon and able also to face the horror of chopped up lively existence or some meat and I don't know there are about half a dozen Goya still lives and they may remind you again of Jericho who in preparation for the uh, raft of the Medusa frequented the charnel houses and painted the heads of people who had been guillotined hmm? dismembered fragments of the world but right at the end of Goya's life a sudden and extraordinary triumph great portraits <coughs> deeply human and reasserting some kind of confidence in the quality of human beings even if they're ordinary human beings and right at the very end at about 1826 perhaps two years before he dies the very famous milkmaid of Bordeaux painted in exile and painted with a glittering and coruscating brush which suggests Oh, a whole multitude of later 19th century painters uh, suggests at one moment Corbet uh, in the solidity of the cheeks at another moment suggests Constable in the skittering whites and thick globules of paint like Constable Snow and in the sky even begins to suggest the soft tremulousness of Renoir and the Impressionists surely you need to study this mysterious man more like an earthquake than an ordinary human being and after the earthquake hmm, what will happen well Goya's own inheritance is an odd one a lot of his work became known because in the 1830s and the 1840s Louis Philippe of France started a Spanish museum and many of course an old officer, an old ranker, had fought in Spain in the Napoleonic, in the Napoleonic uh, armies and so that there was a deep knowledge of Spain. You will find after all that Prosper Merime with Carmen, that... Uh, oh, what's his name? Oh, I can't remember the other French novelist. Damn it. Prosper Merime, who is the other one? Théophile Gautier and a whole host of Englishmen and others go to Spain. Spain becomes sort of romantic backward uh, of Europe more so than Mexico was for a time or New Mexico was for a time you know in the 1920s New Mexico was for D.H. Lawrence what Spain in the early 19th century was for a lot of Frenchmen and Englishmen a place where you could go and be primitive and so what with the Spanish gallery and uh, travelers to Spain uh, Goya became known and you can see of course that this painting of Goya's is absolutely the basis for Manet 
And Mane is again and again deeply influenced by Goya in composition and in content. There we are, the 3rd of May, and here we are, the murder, the assassination, the shooting of the Emperor Maximilian in 1865 in Mexico, and you can see the borrowing. But what about the immediate post-war generation? Well, the crucial character is Theodore Jericho, who you see was born just at the time of the September massacres in 1792 and dies in 1824. A short career, like the career of Masaccio, like the career of Seurat, but an extraordinarily fruitful and strange one. And already at the age of 20, in 1812, he paints a hussar of the Imperial Guard, and it's the last fine, reckless flutter of heroism under the Napoleonic eagle. And the horse rears madly, and the scimitar flashes out, and the tail rips out, and the hussar himself is seeing a ghost, surely. He's seeing, perhaps, the writing on the wall. And the horse is as much in anguish as in heroism, but it's a huge vision of a possible heroism. By 1813, 1814, Jericho's mood and his color have changed. A kind of somber, funereal, blank darkness uh, gradually colds and shadows his color. Uh, no longer scarlet, but a sage, sad red as the wounded Curaça limps home from Moscow. Mm? And no longer is he commanding his steed, and no longer does he look up with anything but a kind of reproachful anxiety uh, as he recognizes the wounds of himself and the wounds of his country the wounds of his world. Rapidly, Jericho comes to a single major masterpiece, The Raft of the Medusa. And the story of the Medusa is a story of corruption, the story of a muddle, the story of typical bureaucratic mess and cowardice. The Medusa was a vessel carrying hopeless colonists down the coast of Africa. It was under some royalist commanders who, when the ship sprang a leak, behaved absolutely dreadfully and left almost all the people to make it or not make it on a raft. And then the people on the raft themselves behaved mm, with predictable nastiness. And as the rations got shorter and the water got more brackish, they began to think of uh, eating each other. And, uh, a rebellion broke out, followed by, we believe, probably some acts of cannibalism. Of course, people didn't, the rescued people didn't much want to talk about this. And it's absolutely characteristic of a young Jericho who'd gone for a couple of years to France. When he gets back uh, to, uh, to Rome, when he gets back to France, to read it all up and then to go and interview the survivors and to find out every little bit he can about it and to take eyewitness accounts in order to find out exactly what really happened. And finally to paint a large picture which was the great success of the Salon of 1819 and which he then brought to England, to London and to Dublin and exhibited to tremendous success because of course it was still a scene of luridness but a magnificence uh, beyond compare. And slides really do not do much justice to it. And indeed, it's not very clean when you go to see it in the Louvre. It is an enormous painting. It's, a, it's about 25 foot wide or something. Ah, and it effulges with a kind of monstrous, bronze-burning, hellfire quality. As though people have lost all sense of being human, have lost all sense of charity, have lost all sense of the fact that somehow or other we have to live upon a single earth. Uh, there are passages of the most extraordinary and wonderful draftsmanship. There are passages of the most extraordinary tragedy. Over here you see somebody who has been half eaten. And maybe, because at some stage they thought they were going to be rescued and then they lost sight of the rescuing ship and then they were finally rescued. You notice the brilliant composition. Well, it is fascinating because Jericho played with a number of different possibilities before he finally stuck on the rescue scene. And here's a preliminary 
Here's a preliminary sketch, and there you see mm, a body being eagerly eaten. And there you see somebody else despairing on it, and there you see somebody else right in the middle of the rebellion and the cannibalism. But he probably thought that he wouldn't be able to exhibit it. And here's another scene of the outbreak of uh, the rebellion, and you can see here corpses struck all over the place, women with their children plucked from them, and so on and so forth. Already a fluttering of a cloth and people reaching up in order to what finally becomes the thing of hailing a ship in the distance. He tried other possibilities. He tried one uh, like this, and then he tried uh, yet others, the rescue coming in sight. The boat, hmm? And then, you can see it's a very simple one, and then he do even does one, Let, are we on to the next? Yes. Of the rescuers arriving and the poor people clambering on board, notice that like David, for these preliminaries, he uses nude figures. And of course, he's haunted by thoughts of Dante, thoughts of the Inferno, thoughts of the illustrations to the Inferno by people like Flaxman. And of course, Blake himself was soon to illustrate uh, the Inferno. But he finally decides on having also planned his little raft. He decides upon, there's a little drawing just of the raft, he decides upon the definitive composition, with the mask going in this direction, people getting up on barrels, and this great motif of the man with his dead son over here, and an unbroken passage here. Finally, he breaks that passage with the most marvelous figure, and I can show you that in a moment. There's a sketch done from it. You notice the black is the person highest hoisted up, and here's a little detail of this particularly moving fragment, and here next we can see a study which is a little bit long in the leg, one might say. Mm -hmm. Showing you how carefully uh, Sherico worked everything out. And here's this Michelangelo-esque, an extraordinary, beautiful, beautiful drawing of a dead body on the fore part of the raft. And the whole thing, of course, is so strange because unlike Goya, Jericho mixes these scenes of despair and horror with passages of absolutely classical painting. And over it all, he produces brushstrokes of infinite tenderness and delicacy and exquisiteness. And thereby, perhaps, deepens one's sense of the tragic elements by giving his painting the full, splendid panoply of great art. And here you see in the final painting. And he's so magnificently painted. It is painted with such skill, such depth, such fullness. And each little touch adds its teeny bit to the tragedy. The tender bending of this. The way in which the nipples and the breast line, the line of the rib cage, hmm, and the heaviness of the broken boats of wood, Jericho's preparations were nothing if they were not thorough. And here we have another couple of studies of dead heads. And he collected dead heads and he collected dead bodies and dead arms in order to get the color of cadavers. Not any joking matter, but a determination to do full justice to the event by an intense visual recreation. So that while Jericho's subject matter belongs fully to the world of the tremendous and extraordinary and exceptional which we associate with Romanticism. His methods are at once a mixture of the idealism of neoclassicism in the nudes and the sheer beauty of the painting and the insistent realism which of course begins to be the major movement of the middle of the 19th century. So Jericho looks straight ahead to the world of Corbet and the world of the uh, Barbizon painters. Here do you see a little group of limbs exquisitely painted, however dreadful the subject matter may be. And uh, here another wonderful study for that waving figure, full of an absolutely extraordinary vitality uh, and dignity.
And there you see is the whole thing again. An extraordinary and terrifying painting, uh, which really sums up so much that is in Goya, and sums up so much that was in this epoch that was past, and was, of course, itself a beacon to uh, Delacroix. Well, it is not surprising that Jericho does a painting of the race of the riderless horses. Because, of course, riderless horses are free creatures. Hmm? We hope they move beyond or should move beyond the ordinary human world. And in the 19th century, one of the great symbols of freedom is the symbol of the animal. Whether it's tiger, tiger burning bright in the forest of the night, or whether it's the riderless horses of Jericho, or whether it is indeed the horses uh, of Jericho and Delacroix. And here is Jericho who came to England and was deeply influenced by English painting, doing an English racehorse. And so nervous, hmm, there's a little flash of lightning in the distance, and the horse's nostrils stare back up, and his tail is about to go up, and he's about to rear, and he's painted with such intimacy, such grace. Uh, Jericho was a wonderful horseman. And, of course, he really does show something of the influence of that great English animal painter, George Stubbs. And so, to interpose a little ease, let us dally with false surmise and look at the paintings of Stubbs, because Stubbs really, in a way, heralds that interest in 19th, uh, of the 19th century in the exotic, in wild nature. Here's another Jericho, which again is based on English sporting paintings and goes back to the elegances uh, and splendor of Stubbs' silhouette, Stubbs' great wonderful love of horses, Stubbs' scenes of great huntings. Uh, this is the Duke of Northumberland, and here I'm going to show you a detail. What a wonderful painter. Isn't that extraordinary? Isn't that so magnificent? Don't you wish you'd seen the Stubbs show of the Tate Gallery? Mm? the greatest master and an extraordinary person of extraordinary visual acuity the way in which he makes those splashes and his mastery of animal life does his famous cheetah what a beautiful, beautiful creature that cheetah is and how, with what wonderful, impassive sympathy Stubbs paints cheetah and trainers mm? and deer and landscape mm? Stubbs has in a way that is the obverse of Goya. Goya has a digestion for terror, and Stubbs has a digestion for nature in its entirety. Mm? Uh, without any sense of rank, without any sense of preference, without any sense of the fact that nature has its uglinesses, but a sense of nature being in some way supreme. And Stubbs can do horses, and then he can do a zebra, and then he can do a wonderful, wonderful tiger, beside which Blake's little tiger looks such a teddy bear. Uh, this is Tiger Tiger burning bright. Burning bright in the canvases of George Stubbs. He can even do a kangaroo, which he only saw from a stuffed version. He can even do a rhinoceros. Mm, most difficult beast. He did once see a rhinoceros. And Stubbs, of course, can do tiger leopards playing and Stubbs can do horses frightened by lions and thereby set that 19th century love of wild animals flying mm, and liberate the 19th century from the horror of mere sheer humanity. Thank you. <laughs>